live. Mission log number 227. Intention is about how I can explore the infinite possibilities that are open to me from this expanded consciousness which inspiration has generated from me. When we do that, immediately intuition started coming. That is the message from that oneness. Welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. Get inspired and live out loud. From love, freedom, and success to having it all. Here's your host, coach, speaker, and shining star, Orion. Orion, you're looking good. Hello and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. This is your host, Orion. We live in an infinite universe with infinite possibilities. We also have the power to affect our reality, not only by doing, 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 but with our beingness, with our vision. In this episode, we talk about how physics meet consciousness and mysticism. Our guide into this mysterious unknown is Dr. Amit Goswami. He is a theoretical quantum physicist, a retired professor from the University of Oregon and a very accomplished author and thinker. Among his books are The Self-Aware Universe, The Visionary Window, Physics of the Soul, The Quantum Doctor, Creative Evolution, God is Not Dead, Quantum Creative, Quantum Economics, and The Everything Answer Book. In his private life, Goswami is a practitioner of spirituality and transformation. He calls himself a quantum activist and appeared in the film What the Bleep Do We Know and its sequel, Down the Rabbit Hole, as well as the award-winning documentary, The Quantum Activist. I was so impressed with him beyond his extreme knowledge and how smart he is. He is just a really loving, kind human being. And I am so grateful. I had the honor of interviewing him and having him on this show. So you're in for a real treat. And now, without further ado, on to the show. Two, one, zero, Hi, Amit, and welcome to Stellar Life Podcast. I am so honored that you're here. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, Orion. It's great to be here. Thank you. Thank you. So before we, we dive in, can you uh, tell me a little bit about yourself and how did you develop the passion for what you teach? Well, actually, I was a physics professor. Uh, very far from my thoughts was that I will never delve into consciousness research and actually discover some very necessary answers for these days. It all came because at one point I was promoted to full professorship and academic ladder that is the top, and I didn't want to be an administrator. So I thought, okay, I now can really explore things that are very tough. I've never done very difficult problems. There is that quantum measurement problem, which uh, people say nobody can solve. So let me try that one. That's one of the motivations. There's also a story behind it, but it takes too long to get into that. (laughs) (laughs) All that together gave me the incentive. Uh, Of course, it took years and years. So incentive is one thing. Actually doing it is another thing altogether. But I knew that. So I was steadfast, and of course, eventually the answer started coming in mid-80s. I started in mid-70s, so 10 years, more than 10 years of search. But uh, ever since, I really have been doing consciousness research, both experientially and theoretically. And now, of course, we also have founded a University of Transformational Education. This, I think, is we can claim a first. This is the first time that a scientific version of integrated science and spirituality will be used for actually transformative education. In other words, we teach people how to transform. We insist that they do transformational exercise. And indeed, we even test them on transformation when finally they will graduate, get their degrees. 
Yeah, because there there is such a separation between consciousness and science. Yes, and quantum physics has reached that. There is no separation now. A big problem, of course, always has been that science has been a science of objects, but consciousness, as everybody knows, has both subject and object. There is a subjective aspect of consciousness that we call I, the experiencer, that cannot be denied. Although it is true that when we are in ordinary state of consciousness, the I-ness of the I, the fact that I am I, independent of objects, that is not as clear. In other words, most of us look at I also as an object, me. And that confuses a lot of people, true. But nevertheless, anybody can meditate a little and expand his or her consciousness enough to see that there is an I, we can fall into it and we feel happy, relaxed. So anybody can verify that indeed there are expanded states of consciousness, which leaves no doubt that there is self, there is consciousness beyond our ego. That ego is the me. That me can be transcended. Me can be, uh, we can get, get behind to more of the I and less of the me fairly easily by practices of spirituality. So I have done it myself, and I would like to teach people how to do it. And now we have a theory. We have experimental data, by the way. Very good data has come from neuroscience. And we have uh, all the spiritual traditions giving us plethora of experiences, which we now can supplement with our new scientific insights. What is the difference between the I and the me? This is the major, major, major difference. Would you like a little experiment? Yes, sure, of course. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, the listener can also do it. So close your eyes and look at the objects in your mind's sky. Generally, there will be thoughts, maybe slight emotions that happen. We are curious what's going to happen. So some of those thoughts will come. And let the thoughts go like clouds in the sky. Don't get attached to the thoughts. Okay, so we're not going to do the full meditation. That will take almost like 12 minutes at least. So, but I'm going to say, okay, if you did that, and this is called uh, mindfulness meditation. We are mindful of the objects of consciousness. We are letting them go. We are not attaching to any particular thought. We are letting go of the thoughts, just to watch the thoughts. What kind of thoughts do I think? That's the question we now can answer. A mindful about what my, what my mind does when I am vegetating. Okay, the next stage, we look at ourselves looking at the thoughts. So I'm not only watching the thoughts, I'm also watching me watching the thoughts. So me is now very clear. That is what we usually do. We see us doing various things, usually serving our personal purpose. What is in it for me, transaction, this is what we do today with the ego. Very me-centered individuals, that's what we have become. Okay, so this part concentrates on getting a hang of, okay, what is that awareness, scene of awareness that I create with that me-centeredness? I watch me watching my thoughts. And then I ask the question in third stage, okay, so I'm watching me, watching my thoughts, but who is the I that is watching? I can make that into a me also. So we regress further back and watch myself, watching me, watching thoughts. Now it's clear where I'm going, right? We can further regress and watch me, watching me, watching thoughts. Watch me, watching me, watching me, watch thoughts progressively more further and further back. But very soon we get very frustrated because we just cannot keep track of how many me's are watching, right? <laughs> no. In frustration, we give up. We can't do it anymore. And when we give up, we relax. And we relax, feel happy, feel expanded because we have fallen into a deeper state of consciousness. That's our real eye. Yeah, I feel it. Good. Yeah, wow. This is so cool. So we look at ourselves from so far away 
that we cannot be so attached to our thoughts and our ego and our identity. Yeah, that is the trick. Detachment from the yeah, I that is doing the things, become the doer of things, that is the thing. That is what we need to do in order to get an outlook from the point of view of a deeper consciousness. Nice. And some of us do that. And because some of us do that, the world has still not gone to the dogs completely. Although it, it's going close every day. Yeah, and we talk more. we'll talk more about that later. And before we do, I want to ask you, first I want to share an experience I had when I went to India and I spent some time at Oneness University and we were meditating every day. And then the very last day we meditated in the in their temple and we did an exercise where we were breathing rapidly and saying, I am existence, consciousness, bliss for 49 minutes. And you, because you breathe like that, you get really dizzy. And then we got into a different state and the monks who, or avatars, they got into this very different state and they they came and they were blessing us giving us a diksha a oneness blessing and i had an out-of-body experience Uh and my my spirit went out of my body and i i was in like this like technicolor realm it was very orange and bright and it was like almost like i was dancing with the with the monks we were all kids and then it was a very psychedelic experience Induced by the breathing and the diksha. Yes. And n- not n- no drugs <laughs> involved. And then my spirit went out, up, and I was on the top of the temple. And I saw a monkey and I started laughing because I knew the monkey thought that he was the king of the temple. And then I, I, I kept going and almost like my spirit went into the body of a stray dog. And I could see the world from the eyes of the stray dog. It was wild. And while this is happening in my mind, in the physical realm, I am on the floor laughing out loud like I've never, I was usually more conservative with my laugh before that, but I was laughing out loud for, I don't know, an hour, an hour and a half, how long, however long this was. Some people were crying, some people were laughing. It was, it was wild. And then they, they hit the little gong. And boom, I was there, back, centered, like normal me, like nothing happened. And when I came back from India, I used to have ADD or ADHD. I don't know. It was self-diagnosed, but I could never really focus on someone without looking to the sides and, and losing concentration. And after I came back, something happened with my neurology and I was able to really focus on my clients, almost like there was a, a bubble between me and my clients. And I was able to be there. Right. Yeah. So I, I had that experience of oneness. I had a taste of it, but I never, ever experienced it since like that. Maybe like glimpse of awakening. Those are very special situations that I'm glad that you have because this is one of the ways that we can get a profound understanding of what reality can be. We have enormous infinite potentiality actually to explore and manifest. And because of lack of such experiences, people never even become curious. Because, um, you know, when you hear it from someone, uh, of course, that does make some impression. But let's put it this way. Meditation in a deliberate way, it has to be done with patience, uh, some resilience. And as you said, most people today suffer from ADD, things like that. So it is very tough for them to focus for very long as meditation takes. Whereas if you get into a ritualistic experience like you did, and in a foreign country, which is supposed to be a spiritual culture, and it is still to some extent, and then that ambience creates very special situation. Right. And if your mind is receptive, like it was for you, then you get these wonderful experiences. But remember, it is a synchronicity. It, it, it's not meaningless. I mean, you deserved it in some ways. So you can go deep into it. And um, I'm glad that it got rid of your ADD because that kind of thing one would expect. But it, it will flower in your life much more. 
You just wait and see. Wow. Let it let me. Don't stop it. Yeah, wow. This is amazing. Thank you so much for the acknowledgement. And uh, sometimes when I tell this story, I feel like I'm a little crazy or people are going to think that I'm crazy. <laughs> no, it's all kosher. Very scientific. Quantum science, now, this is one of my pleasures as I more and more realize the scope of the human experience, what quantum science can vouch for and how much of it we already have verified. It's amazing. Mm. Simply mm. amazing. Is quantum science about having multiple universes or parallel universes and stepping into whatever version that you want to become? And from that point, you manifest whatever you want to see? Well, one thing at a time, what you want to become, that's something that we can give some credence because there is science behind it. Parallel universes, unfortunately, is one of the materialist escape. It's a philosophically attracted a lot of people, but it has no scientific basis. It is wrong. It does not solve the quantum measurement problem. It has therefore no theoretical basis, but as I said, many people use it to justify their materialist beliefs. But the scientific materialism is wrong for so many scores. It does not even agree with experimental data that we now have, data called non-locality, signalless communication between not only quantum objects of submicroscopic material world, but also between people, because people also are quantum. This is what quantum science establishes. So there is just now, and brain data, as I said, brain data clearly exhibits non-locality in the brain. With this evidence to back us, it is very difficult for materialist science to stand on anything that is but belief. So as a belief system, it is still dominate most of the scientists, for one reason or another, and that probably will be for decades if people don't change, don't take in their own hands and demand that the scientists listen to data, scientists listen to theory, which is absolutely impossible to deny. Mm. And what about multiple dimensions? Multiple dimensions, certainly. There are two domains of reality. That is, that is what I'm talking about. Non-locality proves it just absolutely. There can be no doubt about it. Non-locality means that there is signal-less communication. Such communication is not possible in space and time. Therefore, we conclude that there must be another outside of space and time, another domain of reality outside of space and time. So that is a lot of people call it quantum reality or call it quantum domain of potentiality. But what's in a name? I, what is the truth is that this is our, what our consciousness is. That is our consciousness. That domain outside of space and time, like mystics identified long time ago, Jesus, Buddha, they all said that there is such a domain and that is where reality is. And that reality has been called consciousness in the Hindu Vedantas and consciousness also in the Jewish Kabbalah. And that is the best way of seeing it because it immediately establishes a long lineage of these thoughts. Some people call this uh, domain quantum field, but I don't like the phrase so much because it gives an idea that consciousness is an object, which it isn't. It's both subject and object. So if you say quantum field, you have to qualify that. It's a very special quantum field, which when it splits up on measurement, it becomes both subject and object. But much better to just call it consciousness. Yeah, it's just so exciting and quite hard to grasp sometimes. So what happens in the quantum domain of consciousness? So what happens is that we, it's a domain of potentiality, infinite new potentiality is waiting for us. So what we need to do is to relax the identity with our ego, ordinary state of consciousness, and just that relaxation which in spiritual terms we say surrender. Surrender the ego to the purpose of higher consciousness. We surrender, we relax, we give up being in the ego because it's closing us from these possibilities. And then in that surrendering, we can fall into that oneness consciousness where there is no separateness between any of us. Normally it is unconscious and it is still unconscious 
that, but we now can process in the unconscious, although a part of us can also process in the conscious, and that processing leads to creative experiences. This is a state which many people have gone into. There are many names for this state called peak experience in transpersonal psychology, called Samadhi in the Eastern traditions, called Satori in Japan, Holy Spirit experience in Christianity. So this experience is very well known. Anyone can have this experience. You had an experience which is pretty close to that. You are not looking for the eye so much. You became very interested in that feeling of the out of the body. So you concentrate on that. I felt a sense of oneness. I felt like I was a part of everything. Very good. Yes. Okay. So that, that in a centered, much more centered way, because the out of the body experience is a little distracting because it's, it's so attractive yeah. feeling <laughs> out of the body. So that takes a lot of your attention away. When a pure samadhi, you don't have much recognition of the objects. They all seem to be all in that oneness. That is very overwhelming in in that sense. It is a much better, let's say, acquaintance with what consciousness is like, that oneness is like. And so once you have that, once you have this kind of experience, then it is very easy to understand what quantum physics is about, how we can make a science based on this idea, all these things. And this is what I have done for the rest of my life. Once I became aware of this, then there was no turning back. Yeah, because God is an experience. It's not an idea. You want to experience it for yourself, right? Yes, one can experience very close to God and but then there is a state which you cannot experience, which is God beyond experience. Now, this state is also known in mystical traditions and also quantum science now establishes it completely. That's the domain of potential. It's unconscious. Can we have a taste of the unconscious now from which when you wake up, it is different than waking up from sleep? The answer there is affirmative. Uh, I haven't had that deep and acquaintance with consciousness, <laughs> you know, that depends on enormous amount of motivation and creativity, so we'll see. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I have a small baby, and I was wondering, do babies feel into the world in a different way that is more oneness-like, and when do we stop that? When do we become more connected to our ego and less connected to those, those realms? This is such a good question. In quantum science, we study this uh, child development question a lot. Piaget did a very good study, but the context of his experiments were all based on the modern scientific ideas, which are based on the metaphysics that matter is everything. So his mind was clouded. So the kind of thing that he did was very thinking-based kind of thing. And he did good within that boundary. But, of course, uh, now we are getting into areas which only quantum science can handle. And, of course, spiritual traditions can handle, but that's not science. But in quantum science, we can talk about this. We can talk about quantum cells, and we can ask the question, as Carl Jung already did, even before me, within his psychology, he had this concept of non-locality. And so he also asked the same question, and his answer was affirmative, so is mine. Quantum science is telling us that, yes, in the first year, a child does not really even have much of a thinking self. That takes about a year to develop. So before then, the child basically, the baby basically cognizes with feelings. Mm. And feelings tend to be a lot more non-local than our thinking mind is. So definitely the first year, mothers and children are very much connected, non-local. Have you been a mother? Yeah, yeah, I am. I'm a mother. My baby is uh, eight months old, and I'm in awe in, of, of the magic of what it is, what, what he is, and, and our connection. Okay, so you know already that non-local connection is something that you enjoy with your baby, and this is why... 
mothers have babies repeatedly because they just cannot forget that joy of that non-local experience. Yeah. And you have that only when the baby is in that state purely. That so that will that will pass after the first year. Unfortunately, but of course the other part of the you know, growing up is also very important. But then we can promote this part. We can let the child live in a sort of enchanted way with a lot of non-local interactions with creatures that are not so mind-oriented. In other words, what I'm saying that, okay, it's all right for uh, children, babies to interact with grown-ups and mental person, people, but it is also perfectly okay for kids to, for little kids, um, one to five, to interact a lot with trees, with animals. It's wonderful. You know, I grew up like that. And it is an enchanted world that the kids have the opportunity of living. You can read about that in poems written by William Wordsworth. I don't know if you have read his Lucy poems. I did not. <laughs> They're a beautiful rendition of an enchanted childhood. So we have we are losing that. We almost have lost it. But even now, America is such a huge country. Um, I live in the state of Oregon. If you, uh, I don't know if you have been to Oregon, but if you come, you will find that there are miles and miles and miles of trees and rivers. And if you take a trip there, you become one with the trees, and this non-locality immediately becomes our experience. And that is the state that children routinely have without making any effort from until about the age of five. So in India, they worship children until the age of five. They're called God. They are not supposed to be put thinking restrictions on them. You give a lot of freedom to them, in other words, to be enchanted and live in their very expanded reality, which adults cannot access because they are in their thinking mind, local mind, constricted consciousness. Yeah, when I was a child, it brings me to my childhood. I always desired this for, for my baby. I mean, now with COVID-19, we're quite limited with, with where we can go, but we do go to the park every once in a while. And when we go around the block, I always stop and I have him touch the trees. And I I always crave this, like me, myself, I crave this interaction with animals, horses, dogs. I, just, I love animals. And when I grew up, we had a backyard full of trees And I, I'm from Israel, so tons of feral cats. And every spring I saw the mothers and the little babies and I would really watch them. I would really like watch them. I would imagine, I imagine I was a zoologist and I'm researching nature. And I even learned like that the voices that the mom make to, to call the, the little kittens. And I think this interaction, like I is, was so good for me as a child to feel the earth, to play with the trees, to play with the cats, to look at the birds, to look at the ants. So important. So important and, and so impossible in people with babies, with children who grew up in big cities, especially, although there are parks and some of them are quite beautiful and so extensive like New York Central Park. Certainly availability is there, but the problem is, of course, that we have created our life in such a constrained way that where is time for busy parents to take their kids to Central Park every day or every evening or every now and then at least. And then, they, you know, these are the severe shortage of consciousness, depth of consciousness that we are creating for our kids for the next generation. It already, of course, has happened enormously because of computers and cell phones and the constriction of consciousness because today's kids are no longer looking at meaningful things or purposeful things. They are much more interested in gadgets, quick answers and information. And now with coronavirus, the situation is another calling for more constriction. And so, you know, can humanity manage this? So we'll see. This is a big situation of danger as well as enormous opportunity to create a new world because obviously the old fantasies of everything is matter, we are machines, we don't have to do anything to change, there's nothing to explore. That fantasy world is stopping, it's just not working. So might as well give it up and re-examine where we went wrong and then correct our course and uh, see if we can get back this enchanted vision of human life. Mm. 
Did humanity manifest it? What's going on on the planet right now? <laughs> well, I think that um, uh, many people are of this field. And my guess is that about 15% of people are actively you know, visioning these new changes. So we'll see. I mean, I'm a very optimistic person by nature. And uh, now with the science fully developed, uh, um, science of a consciousness, science that integrates science and spirituality and makes transformation a real thing that we can make happen in our life with some practices, some theoretical learning, some experimental data. Now, this is just wonderful time also to live, provided we make room for that enchantment. Mm. So I've been stressed lately, stressed out lately. I started going down rabbit holes of information and theories about New World Order or Agenda 21 and looking at our rights being almost taken away from us, like they're taking a, a candy from a baby and baby doesn't do anything or doesn't, doesn't even see it. So I don't know. I need your advice. Yeah, it, it is the thing. I mean, there will be alternative visions and then the choice is ours. Which one do we choose? Today, we live in a world where truth and lie get equal footing. Yeah, yeah. Fake, <laughs> fake news everywhere. So it is a very dangerous time also. So it depends on how quickly those of us who see a broader perspective of human life, how quickly we can make our point, how quickly this paradigm shift that is now a reality in science actually actualized in society. Society is hardly recognizing any of the progressive part of science, although to my uh, somewhat of a pleasure, uh, people know about it. I mean, I get always surprised that in places where I don't expect to hear about quantum, all of a sudden, people will say, oh, you are a quantum physicist, tell us about it. So that's pleasant, that's good to know. But the knowledge has to go much deeper than just curiosity. People have to know that we have a science of transformation. We can actually access this infinite potentiality and change and really set our lives to different goals than just uh, satisfying pleasure and live day to day struggling for survival. Mm. How do you manifest a, new, a better world? That's it. I mean, we, we start with, you know, I have a recipe. I call it the seven I recipe for manifesting whatever good that you want in your life. And the seven I's are, let me first tell you the words, they're all I words. The first one is inspiration. Second one is intention. Third one is intuition. The fourth one is imagination. Fifth one is incubation. The sixth one is insight. And the seventh one is implementation. So inspiration is expanded consciousness. This is not difficult even now, even with coronavirus, even when we are quarantined in our apartment or house, if we are so lucky. And then, uh, even then, what we can do is listen to some expansive music, classical music, or we can look at a flower. We can still find flowers and bring them home. Uh, little trips to supermarket is still allowed. And we can look at sunset. We can look at the moon. There are so many ways we can expand our consciousness. That expansion is what inspiration is about. And then intention. There is a way to intend. We intend what we desire, but we intend from not from the point of view of the ego. We generalize it. We also say, okay, I intend by I want to, I want to intend for everybody. And immediately, as we have done that, as we expand our consciousness, we already are in that expansion because we are inspired then it seems like we cannot really desire for trivial things. Desire is just satisfaction of my old memory stuff that I enjoyed before. Now I want to expand myself. 
I want to expand myself by inquiring into stuff that I have not experienced before. In other words, I want to into the want to go into the exploration of new meaning, new contexts of living. This is what intention is about. Intention is about how I can explore the infinite possibilities that are open to me from this expanded consciousness which inspiration has generated from me. When we do that, immediately intuition started coming. That is the message from that oneness. These are the values, love, beauty, justice, truth. They are also called archetypes in Plato's language. And then begins the creative process. Imagination, incubation. Incubation is a very quantum process. Psychologists call it unconscious processing, but without using quantum physics, you cannot even understand what it's about. And then insight, this is where you get the aha experience. A surprise, a new insight comes, and then implementation is when you manifest this new insight in a product. The product can also be you, that's the transformed you. So the same seven eyes can inspire you to get into creativity in the way that artists and uh, musicians practice, or it can get you into real transformation of who you are, how you relate to people, how you relate to the world, how you relate to yourself. So it is a great journey, this journey of seven eyes, much, 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 much better than the three R's, which we are not denying their importance. I mean, of course, you have to learn to read, learn to write, learn to learn some arithmetic to do your accounting of expenses. Of course, they are important. But they should not take on our whole life. Life is something else. Life is about the seven eyes and this potentiality that we can explore and manifest in our lives. Amen. In order to get to this place of inspiration, I think one needs to learn to reduce stress and reduce anxiety, which is happening a lot, happened to me, a lot of people around me. And I think I think globally there is this dense energy and, and, and a lot of fear and uncertainty of people are talking about the second wave and the second wave and and everything that all the consequences and ID twenty twenty and so there is a lot of uncertainty about the future. And I I agree that in order to change we need to use the tool that you said and that you shared with us and we need to affect the field with our vibration from a place of love, not from a place of fear. And with all the stress, what, do you have any anything you can share, any exercise that one can do to reduce stress? Absolutely. I mean, this is, this is a very important point that you have raised. Uh, emotional stress is the biggest enemy we have against this expansion of consciousness that I'm talking about. And, you know, look, the expansion, once you learn to expand your consciousness, then really uh, this confinement that we are all suffering, and the confinement, as you know, is necessary to contain this virus. It is an epidemic. It's a pandemic. So we better do what the health experts are telling us. That does not take a genius to appreciate it. Of course, people can be stupid. But apart from that, the problem staying home that most people face is this all this stuff that you mentioned. Among them, principal is, of course, the emotional stress that one has because there is just doesn't seem to be any release from it. So what is the, the remedy? This stress is created because we have negative emotional brain circuits. And when we are not getting our way, then that ego strikes back, we are fully in our ego, when we are fully in our ego, then the ego becomes very controlled by what the brain offers. And brain is very big on this negative emotional brain circuits and the pleasure circuits. So you notice that people are going big time into pleasure. You know, Netflix uh, is doing enormously good business. <laughs> uh, social media, they're thriving. And the reason is people have become big pleasure seekers. By the way, pornographic industry is doing so great. And and also instant gratification. 
Yeah. And so Catholic priests are feeling compelled to speak against it. Uh, so, you know, it, it is really a very sad rendition that, you know, these people don't even know that you know, what I'm talking about, what you are talking about, we have both who have experience. So how to bring from there to here, how to remove emotional stress. This is not actually such a hard problem. It is hard if people never have heard the word meditation. It is hard if people have never heard about breathing exercises or qigong. We have energies in connection with our body organs. These are non-physical energies, quantum energies, but it is completely scientific. We call it energy of life or vital energy. And these energies is what we feel. When somebody says, I feel love for you, it is an energy that uh, he or she is feeling in the heart. And that is the real, there is a real organ in the heart, the thymus gland which when suspended, uh, when the function is suspended because it distinguishes between me and what is not. When that distinction goes away is when we are experiencing loving someone. Uh, that, is the, that is me. All of a sudden you become me to me. And when you become me, then I care for you as much as I care for myself. That's what we call love. So feeling of love, where we feel it, we feel it at what we call the heart chakra. The, the the place where the heart is, but it's not at the heart, it's the thymus gland, which is part of the immune system. So this is very, very scientific, this feeling. And it is these positive feelings with which you have to learn to compensate those negative emotions which are built into the brain. Negative emotions like all those things, anger, jealousy, lust, and this abusiveness, which is, uh, you know, we heard a lot of complaint about spouse abuse, child abuse, how to uh, keep a control over them with these positive emotions. How to invoke the positive emotion, though, that's what the problem is, because we never have taught these people how to meditate without meditation, especially men cannot engage with the heart. So thinking men, especially those people who are just mental enough or intelligent enough to just process their cell phone, they really have a hard time dealing with this and their spouses and children are helpless, hapless victims of these people. And unfortunately, this is why I call this crisis such an opportunity. Mm. We really have to redesign our education to teach people what is really important. Like this is really important, not to abuse our relationships. We know how to do relationships. We know how to do arithmetic. We know how to read and write, but we don't know how to relate even to our people who live with us. And that is just such a shame. If we knew, then of course, Living with those people confined quarters could be just enormously rewarding because it could do so much loving. Just imagine that. Yeah. Do you have any relationship tips for for quarantine and, and this new changing world? Absolutely. I give up in, in our university. We have a whole course on quantum science of love and relationship. What we teach is this loving with energy moving the, we know how to move energies. For example, we teach how to convert sexual energy into love energy. Uh, you know, Freud had the inkling of the idea already. He talked about sublimation. He talked about changing sexual energy into an energy that he called libido, which can uh, get into high thinking, which of course he did plenty, but people did not understand him. Um, now, of course, we have the science to understand it, and we know the science of moving energy from the uh, sexual organs into the love organs mm. into the, you know, and higher. And with that technique, it is just easy thing to master. Now, I mean, it's still not easy because you have to meditate, you have to be dedicated, you have to invoke creativity. I'm not saying it's that easy, but but we know the technique, and therefore. You practice it, and, and eventually you can do it. It's not hard anymore. It does not have to happen 
just because some synchronicity experience blessed us with it. We can do a protracted process to make it happen. Mm. I want to take this course. It sounds amazing. <laughs> <laughs> We'd love to have you arrive. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard when you're stressed. It's hard to come from a place of love. And I think also men and women, they interpret sexual energies in a different way. Where like, I think I think when a man is stressed, he want to release through sexual energy. And when a woman is stressed, she's holding on to her sexual energy. Right. Women have much less problem about some of these things that I am talking about. Unfortunately, there are also the gentler, uh, weaker sex, you know, physically speaking. They are emotionally very much stronger than men. But when men get angry and abusive, then, of course, women is quite helpless and they depend on the growth in civilization that we have had in the last 2,000 years. But now, you know, when such calamities take place and we are confined in close quarters, the beast is just waiting in the brain, and if you don't know anything but only your me-centeredness and the brain, that you know, will fall prey to those uh, circuits. And then uh, this is the danger that we are facing. Human civilization, especially the gentler folks among us, and the more grown-up folks among us, than the women survive this. 70% of the quantum activists, uh, people who are actively pursuing quantum science, are women. Women are taking the leadership in this movement. So I'm very proud of women. That's amazing. Well, as a woman, thank you. <laughs> this is great. Do you have any other advice for us to be better partners and parents during this time? I think that we, we definitely can also improve much on parenting. I'm so glad that we got to talk about a little bit about the enchantment of childhood. Mm -hmm. But, you know, this is the, the failure of the education that we have set up. The meaningful stuff of life, parenting, how to maintain relationship, how to love, these things are completely thrown out the window as far as the curriculum, education curriculum anywhere. Mm -hmm. Even in uh, colleges, even at universities, to have people get degrees in relationship, but only in the cognitive behavioral way of engaging relationship. Mm -hmm. They acknowledge the existence of feelings in our body. Now, uh, they don't acknowledge heart or anything like that. What kind of relationship can we build when we are ignoring, neglecting the most of what human being is about, just worshipping the material body and whatever is in the brain does not get you anywhere in terms of growth in consciousness, growth in joy, growth in things that we really, really need. Mm. So how to engage in these things more just become interested in changing the worldview. There are other perspectives. Look for it. The internet is a good place, although it's much abused by the thrill seekers and pleasure seekers, but the real stuff is also available. I have a website myself, and if you just look into that, you'll find a lot of information about our university, about you know, transpersonal education in that is going on in every part of the world today. They're not just me alone. Other people are doing it too. So can I tell the uh, audience my website? Yes, please, please. I want you to share that. They, everybody needs to know about your website. The website is Amit Goswami, A-M-I-T-G-O-S-W-A-M-I dot O-R-G. Amit Goswami dot org. And I also recommend beyond like considering studying in your, your university to research you and read your books and look on YouTube for your videos because they are extraordinary. I'm so grateful for everything that you share and everything that you shared with us today. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. It is a unique thing that is taking place uh, in the world. I'm very glad to be part of it. Also very thankful that people like you are interested and having me as your guest and talking about it to a large audience. Yeah. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Amit, so much. Before we say goodbye, 
I want to be respectful of your time. Can you give us your three quick top tips to living a stellar life? What we need in the world is people with moral leadership, people with moral integrity, people with values that do what they talk and can teach what they're talking about. This is really what we need. And we need it so bad that anyone who is really looking for a stellar life, there is no better way than to save civilization. Save civilization from the lives of people who are destroying it. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Thank you. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thank you, listener. Remember, transform, 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 step into leadership and connect to pure, beautiful values so we can save the world together and have a stellar life. This is Orion. Till next time. Thank you for joining me on my mission to light people up and change lives around the world. I hope today's conversation inspires you to step up, go after the life of your dreams, and be who you want to be. If you enjoyed this episode, make sure to go to StellarLifePodcast.com for show notes, transcripts, and other cool stuff. And please subscribe, review, and help spread the word by sharing us on Facebook and Twitter. Have a lovely day, and I'll catch you on the next episode.